This episode of Bulletproof Cashflow is brought to you by Realty Dynamics. Learn how people like you can build substantial passive income while creating wealth for the long term through real estate investing. Visit rdyne.com. That's R D Y N E.com. Yeah, I remember when I used to get calls like that, and I used to get so excited when they said, oh, they got a deal, and I just get really pumped up, and then by the time they're done telling me about it, I'm deflated again because it is a crappy deal, right? So now even I take it with a grain of salt. When someone says, I got a great deal for you, you know, I ask them to tell me about it first before I even start to think about getting excited about it because, yeah, when you're first getting started, you're not going to see the best deals, and you need to really be able to scrape and find the opportunity sometimes. Working because you want to, not because you have to, is financial freedom. And we want to help you create that. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. We're going to teach you how to achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host is a multifamily syndicator and property developer. He's done deals reaching into the hundreds of millions of dollars. You'll hear from experts in all aspects of real estate investment, finance, finance, development, and management. Everything you need is right here. This is the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. And this is your host, Augustino Pintus. Hey everyone, it's Agostino. Capital raising for your apartment deal starts well before you send in your first LOI, your first letter of intent. That's because once you get a deal under contract, it's at that point the clock starts ticking. But you have a tight timeline to get your investors on board and let them know what makes a deal so great. And of course, raise the capital you need to close. Now, it's super important that you build these relationships with potential investors up front. And the hard part is, of course, getting started, you know, getting the motivation you need, getting organized with what you need to do to go ahead and establish those relationships. Now, today's guest knows all about this, and he has definitely lived through it. Now, he's learned early on that he needed to forge those relationships and build a pipeline first before presenting opportunities to invest in a deal. Now, of course, it wasn't always the case. He started investing in single-family homes in 2015 and built a portfolio of about a million dollars a million dollar portfolio and nine properties across three states. And then from there, he made the decision to quit his nine to five job and went all in on multifamily. And, you know, he did it as a way to get the investors to take him seriously. Now, when he put in the work, he was able to raise that same million dollars in 60 days. So today he is a managing partner at Vertical Street Ventures. It's a multifamily firm investing in the Phoenix and Tucson markets. He's also the host of the Passive and Come through multifamily real estate investing podcast. With all that, I'd like to welcome my good friend Kyle Mitchell. Show Kyle, buddy, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Now, guys, like what Kyle has to say, you can reach him via the contact page at verticalstreetventures.com. Okay. Uh, okay, Kyle, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your journey and, and how you got started in all this. Yeah, I started investing in real estate back in 2010, just kind of as an alternative uh, way of investing. I, I've never been a big stock market person, never invested in the stock market, except one time, you know, I lost $2,000 in about a week when I was 16. And that was the last time I did that. So um, I naturally just started investing in real estate in 2010. And, you know, got my portfolio up to about 10 homes, like you had mentioned. But I quickly learned it was tough to scale. And I, I wanted to scale up to where I could replace my income, which I felt would have to be around 100 to 150 homes. And so I immediately started looking for other ways to invest in real estate. And that's when I found multifamily. And I absolutely fell in love with the business model. And 11 months after finding it, I, I jumped ship, left my W-2 job to pursue, pursue it full time and been doing it ever since for the last four years. Nice, nice. I think a lot of people make that transition. They they, they have the intent of building, uh, building like a big portfolio of single family. And I think you realize, just, I'm sure you did too. It's tough to do that sometimes, right? It's tough to build a portfolio of single family. You know, it's uh, especially when you're trying to get to a hundred houses or whatever. It's, a, it's it's really a slow going type scenario, right? It is. And then at, at 10 loans, you run into a little bit of a situation with the lending side of things to where you have to get commercial le loans and they don't work out as well. And so your cash flow decreases. But what I found is just that 
the economies of scale. You know, you have 10 homes, they're all in 10 different places, whereas in apartments, you can have 300 units in one place. And so you can have on-site staff seeing it, uh, overseeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. I would assume that my property management company probably visited my property maybe once a year at best, especially if we, if we didn't have any turnover, they may have not gone to the property. And so I just found it, you know, on paper, the performance always looked great when it comes to single family homes. But in reality, the returns just didn't seem to pencil out like uh, the performance always mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that in order for, for you to have that true income when it comes to single family anyway, you need a couple hundred homes minimum just for it to begin to make sense. Cause then you can have, you can hire the right team to help you get, you know, have everything organized so you're not having to mess around with it. Cause that's the biggest thing when it comes to single family, right? Yeah. Uh, agreed. Um, it's just, it's a scalability yeah. issue for sure. Yeah. 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 So, so then, but it sounds to me, and as, you know, as we read through the bio there a second ago, that, you know, you're, you're trying to do this with single family. You've realized multifamily is the way to go. So you basically dropped your, your multifamily or rather your nine to five to go all in on multifamily. So what, what was, what was that decision process look like? What, what, what did it look like exactly? Yeah. So it, my story is that in about 2015, I got burnt out about what I was doing. I was in the golf uh, management business as a regional manager for a golf management company. I had been doing that since really I was 16 years old. So 20 years. And I was just burnt out on that business. It wasn't an industry that, you know, as I sat there at my desk, wanted to, I wanted to be in for another 30, 40, 50 years, right? And I knew that if I was going to stay in that industry, that's what it was for me. Um, and so I started looking online for just different things to do. And it was everything from a startup to starting a couple different companies to investing to a ton of different things. And I found an online course for multifamily. And I said, hey, it, People real like regular people can buy apartments. I didn't believe it, but it was a thousand dollar course. I signed up for it, and three weeks later, I was done with the course, and I was absolutely hooked. You know, my background is in running businesses, but running golf courses, and a lot of what we do in apartments today is the same thing. We're running a business, right? So you're hiring people, you're holding them accountable, you're implementing systems, um, and you're you're managing projects. And so I I really related to that, and I fell in love with the business model of a apartments, value add apartment investing, and I just decided to go all in. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. And, uh, and from what I've read, too, it took you about 10 months to really get the, the guess get get your pipeline built right so you're able to raise the capital you needed is that is this sound accurate yeah that's basically what it was we started a meetup and a podcast and a bunch of other things to to raise capital but it, at a certain point we knew that we were about to get our first deal right after putting in all the work talking with brokers underwriting deals we were close it was a matter of when not if right and so um i wanted to make sure that if i was going to raise capital and be responsible for my investors' money that I want to be doing it full-time. Now, there's people out there that can do it part-time or as a side job and, and do okay, but I just want to make sure that if I was you know, raising a million dollars that I was full-time in this business and managing my investors' money uh, to the best of my ability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that, that that is probably one of the key aspects right there is that for those 10 months, that's a long time. You know, that's a long time. And you, and, and you spent that time cultivating the relationships and doing the hard work of getting the word out there and getting in front of people to, to basically prepare to get your first deal. That, this is, this is all the upfront prep work that takes place that many people are just not willing mm -hmm. to do, right? And that you're doing it. So maybe describe some of that stuff. Did you learn all that in, in that training course or like how how'd you figure that part out? Yeah, so I learned a lot in that training course and I'm glad I took it. And what that training course also told me is to continue to educate myself, right? And uh, I'm, I've am i always been a, kind of a lifelong learner in the things that I love. And once I fell in love with multifamily, I just continued to eat it up even to today. And so it was just surrounding myself with other people who were already doing what I was doing and or wanted to do and then learning from what they did, right? We don't need to go out and recreate the wheel or start from scratch, really. We can use other people's experience to your advantage. And so that's what I did. I went to, you know, national conferences, local conferences, meetups a couple times a week, uh, 
was on the forums, listen to podcasts, whatever I could do to educate myself. And I used that information to then build out my pipeline. And really, we went the route of a educational platform, uh, helping others get started, teaching other people um, how to get started in this space. And, uh, you know, as we grew in our journey, we helped other people kind of come along with us. And that was kind of our goal in building our pipeline to raise capital. Nice, nice. And, you know, that's, I, rem I remember when I was doing this, uh, getting into the game as well, I did the same thing, you know, and, uh, you know, where you have your credibility book and yeah. you, you start mm -hmm. talking, talking it through. Um, talk a little bit about that. So how, how did you build that pipeline and, and how long did it take uh, to, to really get that first commitment out of somebody that they were going to, you know, really believe in you and, um, and when, when you get ready to send them a deal, like how long, what was all that about? How did how that work? Yeah. So, you know, when I, uh, when I left, I, I've always been an introvert. And I think if you met me after I left my job, even a year in, people would say I'm an extrovert, but I really am an introvert. So talking to people is really, it's draining and difficult for me. Um, and so that was the first thing I needed to get over was kind of getting out of my own mind and uh, getting in the mindset of this is not something that I'm really afraid of. It's just in my mind, you can do it type of thing. Um, but we started with one thing and added five more as we grew. So we started with a monthly newsletter. And that monthly newsletter, anyone we met at a conference, at a meetup, at our meetup, whatever it was, it was added to the monthly newsletter so we can kind of start to build that relationship and that momentum. We then created a website. We wanted to make sure that when people saw us and looked into us, we presented professionally. Then we started a meetup. And then after that, we started a podcast. And then after that, we started a second meetup and a second podcast, and then eventually a book. And now we have a national conference. And so, you know, th that was over the course of four years. So when you take a look at everything, it may seem like a lot, but that was, we started one thing, we did it well. Once we felt comfortable, we added another thing. And it's tough to say when I had my first commitment because we, we started in the business and it took us 18 months to find our first deal. But during that entire 18 months, we were, quote unquote, raising capital, right? We were building our list. We were talking to people about, hey, if I did get a deal that kind of looked like this, would you be interested in investing in it? And to be honest, the people that said yes ended up not investing in that first deal was other people. <laughs> so we got our first commitment maybe in a couple of months, but it wasn't a real one, right? It was kind of like, let's see what you do or yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll invest. I'm interested maybe to get me off their back. But, you know, they're, they're investing now, but they wanted to see proof of concept uh, first. So uh, it definitely took a lot of work, but I'm grateful that I did not get a deal in that first six months, even though I wanted it so bad. I'm not sure we would have been re ready and had the pipeline in order to raise a million dollars in six months. Yeah. You know, it's funny because there's so many people that, that, uh, they rush into it and they, they want to get whatever deal gets, gets in front of them. Even if it's a bad deal, yeah. there's guys I know that have done that. They got into a bad deal. I'm like, man, you don't want to do that deal. It's terrible, but, but I got the money. I got, I got the commitments. I'm going to go ahead and do it. You know, and I'm like, all right, you're going to learn a lot from this deal. I'll tell you that right now. And <laughs> it certainly did it ended up being a bad deal. So, but it sounds to me like you were very, very picky. One, number one, you're very picky about what you were getting into. And number two, uh, I think you also learned the same way I did is that people will say anything to get you to stop bugging them. Yes. Right. So it's that, that's, you know, and that's, and that's okay. If they don't want to, they don't want to invest with you. It's fine. They're different strokes of different folks. Some people, like you, like you said earlier, I, I have friends that love doing the whole stock thing and currency thing. That's fine. I don't get it. I, I know real estate. I believe in real estate. That's what I do. You know, same way you do it too. So that's, uh, that's very, very cool that you did that. So what's, now what sort of systems aside from, uh, of course, of course you, you mentioned the, or I mentioned the, uh, um, uh, the credibility book, but what sort of other systems and processes and tools do you use to continue building up? your pipeline? Like how, how did you, uh, how did you get in front of those folks? What did, how did you record the follow-ups? How did you actually, uh, make sure that when it was time to present to them, what did that process look like? Yeah. And this has developed over the last few years, right? But integrations and technology are huge right now. And there's no reason why you shouldn't have things like this set up, but we essentially used HubSpot, which is our CRM on mm -hmm. where we record everything, but that links up and integrates with Gmail, right? And so anytime someone sends me an email, they all my stuff goes straight into there. So I don't have to re, you know, recreate the wheel or, or do double duty. It, it 
automatically creates a new profile. And then that also speaks with active campaign. So that uploads anyone that's a new, um, a new person. It uploads them into our email database to where now they're getting our monthly newsletter. Now they're not seeing our deals. Back when we were doing 506Bs, we do Cs now so we can publicly advertise. But it would go into a pipeline where they would get added to a, a, a drip campaign that I created that was 23 months long. And over 23 months, we're educating them, cultivating that relationship, setting up calls, things like that. And before on before I did that, it wasn't really integrated, right? So it was one-off conversations, one-off uh, phone calls, sending emails one by one, calling people every other month type of thing. But once you get these integrations going, it can really be a lifesaver and it really helps educate your investors. It allows them to get to know you, but also kind of takes a lot of workload off, off of you, especially the, the small stuff, right? That's where you can get really inundated when you're first starting out. You have all these different things you want to get to and things just seem to fall through the cracks. And so integrating everything has been really helpful for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you just you just uh, touched on something that's very important and very critical is that you didn't need to have all the crazy tools to to really start up. I mean, really, Excel spreadsheet with a, yeah. with a cell phone is all you needed to really just track your follow ups. And that's really where the hard work is. You know, it's kind of like making the phone calls, getting your pitch deck together, your credibility book, and that outlines your team and what the deal would look like and, and all that fun stuff. And then show it and practice it. Show it to someone. See if they're interested in investing with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, we use HubSpot. We use all those crazy tools today to really keep and stay in front of those investors because, you know, maybe they want to invest. Maybe we can educate them. That's fine. But it's um, it's one of those things that when you're starting, you don't have to have all that stuff. It just takes it takes grit and a lot of hard work. That's That's about it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I used to have a list of like two or 300 people and I would call them and you either get uh, hello. Uh, who, who are you again? Who, who's Kyle? I, and it ends up being a really awkward conversation or it just goes a voicemail. No one answers. And then you get, you know, maybe one or two that are like, oh, hey, Kyle. Yeah, thanks for calling me. And so I learned a lot during those phone calls on how to speak with investors, what they're looking for, uh, but also that this is not a very, you know, it's not a, a simple business. I mean, it takes a lot of determination, time and energy and effort. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and you have to get used to a lot of people saying no. <laughs> yeah, which is okay, right? I mean, I, I yeah. was uh, very sensitive to that, to be honest, in the beginning, because I felt like people were saying no to me. And yeah. and that's just not true. And and even if someone says no, it doesn't mean they're not going to be an investor the next time. I always say when you're raising capital, you get to peek behind the curtains of people's lives, right? They're they're not saying no, maybe because they don't like you or they don't want to invest in the opportunity. Maybe they're buying a house and they need that down payment. Maybe they're going through a refinance and need to show liquidity. Maybe they're traveling for the next 30 days. Maybe, you know, their kid just went is going to private school and they have to change some finances. Maybe they're moving. Maybe there's a death in the family. Whatever it is, life happens. And if it's happening while you're raising capital, someone that you thought could say yes will say no. And so that's always going to happen. And you just have to realize that that's life and it's nothing against you personally or your deal. Um, sometimes it's just the timing's not right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think something you do today, which you do a really good job of, is, is staying at the top of mind, meaning uh, nowadays you have the tools that kind of like sends out an email. Hey, here's what we're working on. Uh, here's a deal that we did. Uh, here's here's an update that we did, whatever. Staying in front of them, even if they're not going to do a t deal today, doesn't mean they're not going to do a deal tomorrow. Right. That's yep. it's staying. It's, it's keeping using systems now to stay persistent. Back, back when you were uh, starting up, same way I did, using grit to stay persistent. Yep. Right. Which is which is far far tougher to do. So so one of the things that that uh, you know as as entrepreneurs we're that's what we're doing these days is is looking for deals, sourcing deals, putting these deals together. H how did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Like how how was that? Uh, how was that goal even established for you? You know, I've always wanted to start businesses, and I've never and I've started a few that have failed uh, when I was uh, early on in my life and my career, and so I'd always had that in me. But then I got stuck in a W two job. Really, what happened was I got a job uh, after playing golf professionally for a couple of years, and then I got promoted, and then I got promoted. 
and then I got promoted. And so I got to a point where I didn't even get a chance or an opportunity to think about what I really wanted to do in life because I went straight from golf to to a W-2. And when I got burnt out, I just started looking back and I said, I wish I would have gotten these things done. Now, in the meantime, in between those, I started some side businesses and things like that. But really what got me going is back in 2015 when um, I decided, okay, I'm going to leave my job. I just need to find the next thing. I actually started like a, a meetup of my own of just four or five friends that also had kind of big thinking minds. And every Monday, I called them Moonshot Mondays. We would meet and talk about different business ideas and crazy things like, you know, whatever maybe AI and or building, you know, platforms on the ocean because you can't find any more land. So we're actually going to build land, uh, things like that, just crazy stuff, right? And so at that point, it really got my mind working and it really excited me. And doing those types of things, I realized that, you know, I'm more meant to be an entrepreneur than in a W 2 kind of stuck in that job for. 30, 40 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good thing you did it, right? I'm sure you have no regrets. No I know regrets I don't. Except yeah. I would love to have done it, you know, four years earlier, as, as yeah. I'm sure all entrepreneurs would say. But yeah, <laughs> we're totally blessed in, in where we're at. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have done it. And I'm, I'm grateful that I did do it. Yeah. yeah. Now, one thing that, uh, that, that I've read about you in several places is that you discovered that the brokers took you more seriously. To talk a little bit about that. It's, it's interesting because most people, I mean, they're afraid to leave their jobs. Hey, listen, I know I was. When I was in my 20s, like, you know, the thought about going to do something entrepreneurial back then was, was very scary to me. Uh, I can imagine there's people listening right now that are probably in the same position. But in your case, I think, did, well, did you know that that was going to be a byproduct ahead of time or did you just figure it out after you did it? Uh, it's just one of those things where, you know, you've got to do things. You said earlier, you got to do things other people are not willing to do. Um, and so what we were doing was driving in the middle of the night because we still had our full-time job. Uh, my wife and I, we would leave at like 2 in the morning and get to Tucson at 9 a.m., right? And we would take a weekday off and then work the other six days a week. And so those are the things that other people aren't willing to do. And that's where uh, brokers heard what we did. And they said, okay, these guys are serious, right? They're not going to drive eight hours. Or, I mean, we're driving around from 2 in the morning till 12 a.m. the next morning for 22 hours, essentially, if they're not serious, right? And so um, that's when I realized that, you know, a lot of brokers, they get a ton of phone calls from out-of-state investors saying, hey, I want to buy a deal, I want to do this, and then they never hear from them again, right? And so I knew that I had to show face-to-face -face and, and get out into the market that I wanted to invest in, uh, number one, and then by doing those types of things, we were able to get some deal flow and get the attention of a couple of brokers who said, you know, they really wanted to help us out when they saw the energy and the effort that we were putting in. Hmm. Interesting. Now, how, how did you overcome some of the other issues that brokers usually come up with? Like, you know, you, haven't, you don't have a track record. You haven't, you haven't done this before. Like, how, how did you overcome that stuff early on? Yeah, the educational platform helped a lot. I would say as we grew, the brokers saw that. And I would always point them in the direction of whatever we were doing, right? So, hey, we run meetups. Hey, go look at our website, which we made sure was professionally done. Hey, go look at uh, our new podcast that we're out. And, you know, that stuff doesn't go a long way with brokers and because these brokers also deal with institutional capital guys who aren't really from the educational platform side. They're really two separate sides of the business. And so they deal more with institutional capital too. But when they saw that and, and they saw me grow, that also added credibility. Uh, but we also had a coach and we were able to use a coach as an advisor that we were able to put on there. But it was really just the, the effort that we made. I used to call brokers every other week, essentially. I had a list of 50 brokers and I would just stay in contact with them, stay front of mind, just like we do with our investors. Um, and eventually they either get sick of you and throw you a deal or they want to help you out and throw you a deal, right? And so um, it's a numbers game. If I underwrite a thousand deals, I'm going to find more deals than someone who's underwriting 10 and getting frustrated and quitting. And so I always knew that I'm a numbers person. And so it's pure volume essentially to find a deal. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I think that there's, there is no magic bullet with this business here. I mean, so aside from the capital raising aspect, which is, you know, it could be somewhat exhausting. You know, you're reaching out to every single person you know that has 
uh, some available liquidity to put into a potential deal, you're also spending the time staying, uh, trying to find a deal and staying at the top of mind with these brokers. Like it's, you're, you're, you're doing all of this stuff, right? You're doing all of it. And uh, I like, I like the, the, the idea of what you said, you know, reaching out to these brokers every, every couple of weeks, saying hi, hey, how's it going? It's Kyle. You have a deal for me? No? Okay, I'll call you in two weeks. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> and, and even then you have, to be, you have to be careful because if you've never transacted with them before, chances are it's going to be a crappy deal, right? It's, I'm not saying it's always going to be the case, but uh, I often get very suspicious if a broker I never worked with before suddenly calls me up out of the blue and asks me to buy it to look at a deal. Chances are they would never call me. They would have. They would have already circulated that deal with one of their people, one of their preferred buyers. I've already transacted with them before. You know. Yeah, I remember when I used to get calls like that, and I used to get so excited when they said, "Oh, they got a deal," and I just get really pumped up. And then by the time they're done telling me about it, I'm deflated again because it is a crappy deal, right? So now even I take it with a grain of salt when someone says I got a great deal for you. You know, I ask them to tell me about it first before I even start to think about getting excited about it because. Yeah, when you're first getting started, you're not going to see the best deals, and you need to really be able to scrape and find the opportunity sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, but something that you mentioned before is the, the track record, leaning on a track record. And, and, and really, uh, I guess in your case, you leveraged the, it sounds to me like it was, it was a person that you, you bought their course from. So that was their track record Correct. you're leveraging. Yeah. So it's like yep. you, you paid for the track record, so to speak, yeah, in terms of like you're, you're, you're paying for that, that consulting, you know, that, that, that support. Right. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's, you know, that there's, there's a lot of ways of skinning the cat here, you know, and that's a great way to do it. And, and that, that way you have a set of eyes looking over your shoulder to make sure that the deal you're doing makes sense. You know, that's huge. Yep. And, and look, we didn't start with a massive deal, right? We had to raise a million dollars, but it was a $1.7 million deal, 42 units. It wasn't like I was going after 150 units. I just wouldn't have been ready. Um, and we had been told no before. In fact, we were uh, my first deal that I thought I was going to get was a $3 million deal. We were the highest bidder. The broker told us we were the highest bidder. And after an interview with him, he just decided we weren't ready yet, right? And I'm actually grateful that he said that. Um, but sometimes you just you can't bite off more than you can chew. We started a little bit smaller. The other way to do it is just to join a team um, and take a very small piece or none just to get experience and learn uh, by joining another team, which is why I love multifamily. There's so many different ways to get started in this business. And it's such a team sport that, uh, you know, people look for other people to help join them in, in these deals. And so that's a great way to get started as well and learn from someone who's already been there. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the team aspect that you mentioned a second ago is, is huge. Right. Because in that team, you are also providing value to that team, too. It's, it's not a one way street like either. Yep. Maybe you're the capital raiser. Maybe you're the deal finder. Maybe you're you're a master underwriter or someone that can that can really put the deal together and, and find the value. But it's in any case, there's always something that you have to, to bring to the table. And in your case, I imagine it's raising capital, right? Is that is that your is that your shtick? Uh, you know, I was kind of a jack of all trades. Now I only focus on underwriting and acquisitions. Yep. I do, I still can raise capital, but it wasn't one of my favorite things. And that's one thing that I've really realized is it's important to find out where your strengths are and also where you get the most energy from. Right, raising capital for me is very draining. It's not something I love doing, and I know other people who are better at it, which are my partners, and they're fantastic at it. It, and they love doing it. And uh, it's not something I absolutely love doing. And so what I love doing is kind of being in a spreadsheet and underwriting and talking with brokers and actually being out there touring properties and all that kind of stuff. So I've kind of transitioned. Um, but yeah, I can still raise several million dollars worth of uh, worth of capital because of the relationships that I built over the last four years. Right, right, right. But that's huge, though. I mean, that's huge. Underwriting a deal to make sure it's actually going to work. Because yep. and, and I think and here's the thing. I'm sure the, the the money guys on your team are not crazy about underwriting deals and spending hours on a spreadsheet to figure it out. <laughs> I would imagine, yep, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's, it's it's about rounding out the entire team. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. When it comes to multifamily, that's one of the the great aspects about it is that it is a team sport. It is a team sport, you know, and and it certainly is a a great place to be right now. So, uh, so now where do you see your business going in the next five years? What, what are you guys looking at and what do you guys, uh, what do you, what do you guys think about where, where things are headed? 
Yeah, excited over the next five years. You know, we just started really hiring people over the last eight months. And so we've been a team of three that's grown to 13 that, you know, in about six months will be 20, 25 people. So it's exciting to see this. It's a challenge at the same time. Um, but what we see, where we see ourselves in five years is essentially the owners are going to be a board of directors with a C, the level C-suite uh, executives underneath us kind of running the company um, based on our guidance, of course, and our our, our mission, vision, and values. But uh, that's the hope, is building out that C-suite. We have a fractional CFO that's on board now, uh, want to hire a CEO by the end of the year, um, and start to really think more high level about the business versus being in the business. Do you think you're going to be staying in the same sort of asset class, or are you going to be expanding beyond what you're doing today? We will expand. Uh, even right now, we're doing a little bit of new development. We're doing a, an office conversion to multifamily with a with a new build as well on that same property. So that'll be our first foray into new development, which I'm excited about. And where cap rates are and where uh, cost is per unit, you know, you can build for about the same, if not lower. And so it makes sense to look into some new development for sure. Um, and then storage has caught my eye as of late as well. So just a little bit of diversification. I still think we will be doing multifamily value add. There's no doubt about that. I just love the risk adjusted returns and the business model of it. Uh, but I do think that there is a time in the market where you need to look at other things and pivot a little bit. And I think we're we're coming up on that time. Yeah. And this development stuff, is this in the same market that you're currently currently in right now? Yep. Exactly, the Arizona market. So we really know this market well. It's one of the reasons why we're focused on just this market, so we can know it like the back of our hands, right? That's it's why I moved here. I, I was originally born and raised in Southern California. I moved here a year ago to build out our portfolio. And the more relationships you make in your market, the more you know about it, the more you're living in it, the more opportunity you can see. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in many different ways out yeah, here. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing, though. Uh, you know, we sat, we were actually on a panel some time ago and, or I think we might have even talked about this, but th that in itself is huge too. You know, if you're, if you're active in that market, you know that market, you know what the demand is going to be. If you build, uh, X number of units from the ground up, you know who's going to be living there, you know what the cost is going to be. It's, it's, there's, there's so much to really knowing that market. Uh, here in Cleveland, this is my market. I mean, we, we do ground up here. We do, the, we do, um, of course, stabilized uh, value add type of assets as well, but we really focus on one market. It's here in Cleveland, you know. It's yeah. uh, you know it, you get some you get the the opportunity to scale in this market too, you know. So same thing with you. It's 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 great that you're you're following that that uh, that methodology. I think it's it's amazing. It's great. It's great. That's the way it should be. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So the type of development stuff you're going to be doing. Uh, how how big are these typical deals you're doing right now? Well, so the one that we're doing now, which is a conversion, is going to be converting 44 office. Well, it's an office building. It's going to be converted into 44 one-bedroom units, and then we're going to build 60 uh, brand-new units. And so the total project will be 104 units um, with a mix of converting and adding adding new. Uh, going forward, probably right at that 100 to 150 mark is where we want to be, just over 100 units. Nice, nice. Um in terms of uh, tax credits, do you have any tax credits, do, do, do any type of um, any help from the city or the state government to, uh, to help you build this one or is this uh, you're on your own? Small tax abatement items or credits and things like that. Nothing, um, nothing crazy. Uh, we're going to get some reimbursements on some um, uh, electric transformers that we're installing and some energy efficient things um, that can be helpful, right? They definitely help the bottom line, but no, no massive tax abatements or anything like that. We just bought this at a great basis in a in a tertiary market just outside of Phoenix, and so dealing with the city has been fantastic. It's it's kind of over the counter type of stuff. There's two people that you talk to for the entire city council and so it's made things a lot easier and we are solving a problem that they've wanted to fix for a long time and so we're helping them as well so this is a win-win scenario which is what we look for when we're doing things like this nice nice excellent well, great 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 so do you, do you envision yourself doing more of these types of projects as you go then or um is this going to be like a one-off for the time being 
we are looking for more. They are a needle in a haystack. I mean, it took us a year and a half to find this. And there's so many things when you get into new development um, or converting that need to line up in order for it to be a profitable, uh, you know, opportunity. There's so many different things, whether it's the municipality zoning, um, you know, having to, are you going to have to run all brand new utilities, um, it, all these different things, cost, timing in the market, uh, location. Uh, you know, the size of the lot. There's so many different things to consider. So we are looking for more, but it doesn't always align up. Even parking requirements, right? When you're adding units, you need to have enough parking. And so sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Then you got to go to the city and get variances. And you, you've got to weigh the risk and reward because you can be in $100,000, $200,000 into these things before you even get permitting if the situation, you know, is not in your favor. And so the deal that we did, we were able to to get a six month escrow and get everything lined up before we close on the property. And so we knew going in once we closed, we were gonna be okay. Um, and so those are tougher to do in a hot market because people want you under contract immediately. They want you closing uh, quicker. And in Arizona, they want hard money day one. And so there's a lot more risk there. So we've gotta find the right seller. Uh, so we're gonna be patient with it because it can be a very lucrative um, uh, opportunity, but there's just not a ton yeah. out there. Yeah. Are, what sort of concerns do you have with regard to any economic slowdowns or anything else like that? I mean, the projects that we're taking on, uh, we're doing one of these, one of these office conversions right now. It's going to be well over 400 units. So it's, it's a, that one's a big project. It's actually the building I'm in right now. Uh, but we are doing some ground up stuff, but the majority of these projects have like a, a two year build out maximum, right? Uh, so what, what sort of things are you looking to do in terms of like in, today and in the future? Are you looking to do like longer term, bigger developments or are you sticking to the smaller stuff? Smaller stuff, to be honest, and I like the conversion because we're able to knock that out. So like y'all on the deal that we're doing right now, you know, in two months, we'll have 44 units that are cash flowing. We can refinance out, get some of our money out, which reduces the risk, and then we can build if we wanted to. But at that point, we could actually make the decision, hey, the market's turned, you know, maybe we won't build those. So having multiple exit strategies and being able to be flexible on that is going to be real important for us going forward because, you know, we're definitely not at the bottom of the market. Who knows if we're at the top, you know, who knows, but you definitely want to make sure you have multiple exit strategies to reduce your risk at the time. At this yeah. time. What do you think the, the future holds for the next uh, few years in terms of where the market's headed? I think every day I change my mind. I wish I had a crystal ball. You know, the thing that we look at is we're longer, we're in real estate, we're long term, we're going to be in this business for a long term, and we're very local, meaning we only really invest in Arizona, right? Yeah. And so we love what Arizona's done over the last 12, 13 years. We love what their future plan is over the next five or 10 years. And so they're building infrastructure, 220 people are moving here every day, higher paying jobs are coming in, all those things. So I can't tell, I can't talk about any other market market than Arizona, uh, which is, you know, it, that's by design. Uh, I don't know how, you know, uh, Texas or Florida or South Carolina are going to react, but I do love how Arizona set themselves up. So I know in the long term, this market's going to be a strong yeah, market. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're still looking for the jobs. You're looking for the jobs that are coming into that market and, and you're supporting exactly. it that way. Yeah, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And that to me is the right way to do it, you know. So good. So you know, if you had a piece of bulletproof advice for someone listening right now, what would you tell them to what to do for their next step if they were just looking to get started in uh, in the multifamily space? Yeah, it sounds simple, but be truly consistent with everything that you do. You beat out 95% of your competition by being consistent. And I don't mean over 30 days, I mean over several years, right? So we have a newsletter, it goes out the same time, same day, every month, they haven't missed for four years. We do meetups every month. We do whatever it is that we do, we're very consistent in, in doing it. And I think a lot of people tend to fall off after five, six, eight, even 10 months or even a year or two. And that's when, you know, you're three feet from gold. That's a book that I love. You got to keep going. You got to be consistent. And the more consistent you are, the, the you know, that's that's been my secret. It's just consistency. Yeah, yeah, love it. Love it. 
All right, guys. Well, if you want to reach out to Kyle, you can reach him via his contact page at verticalstreetventures.com. Hope you got some insight on, on how to build your pipeline. And, and also it's a little, little bit uh, behind the kimono there when it comes to development stuff. I think the development's going to be, at least for us anyway, for, for both uh, Kyle and I, it's going to be the future for the time being, it seems. And uh, it's about getting into the right deals and the right vehicle. And of course, getting in there and building quality product that people want to actually live in. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next episode. Take care. You've been listening to the Bulletproof Cashflow Show. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had fun. Make sure to visit our Apple podcast page and leave us a five-star review. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. For real estate coaching, events, and resources, hit up bulletproofcashflow.com. Till next time. No information in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are limited to accredited or sophisticated investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure and subscription documentation and subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice.